All right, we're ready for unit two, part two. In the first section, we looked at some errors in human thinking. We looked at the need for psychological science, and we looked at the descriptive methods that psychologists use to study. We're also going to move on here and look at a couple more methods, specifically correlations and also experiments. Okay, so first of all, correlations. What a correlation is, is basically a predictor that when something happens, something occurs, another event is likely to occur along with it. Okay, so for example, if you, the more, t you notice the more time you spend studying, the higher your marks go. So in this case, A is predicting B. How much you study A, higher marks B. So the more A, the more B. That is a positive correlation. Okay, because the more A occurs, the more B occurs. We can also have a negative correlation, though. We could say um, the amount of time spent online, the lower our scores go. So in this case, it's the more A, the less B. So in this case, it would be a negative correlation. Okay, what we'll use to indicate this, the, the statistical measure is called a correlation coefficient. And it's a calculation that's done that say how how closely are these things related and it's always a number between negative one and positive one now keep this in mind negative one and positive one are equally correlated it's just that when it's negative one it means it's a negative correlation when it's positive it means it's a positive correlation okay and we'll have a look at what we call scatter plots too which is a visual way of looking at this so let's look at this data on this chart. We have height in inches and temperament. Temperament is how reactive you are to things. Okay, so we have some temperament scores that a psychometric psychologist has probably figured out a way to measure, and we compare it to the height in inches. Now, have a look at that data. There are 20 data points. Okay, so is there a correlation? Does it seem related? Well, it's kind of difficult to tell on that. But what we can do is we can do what we call a scatter plot. And this scatter plot, if we look at it, it shows a dispersion of these dots. These are the points plotted on from the, from the data. And when we look at this, you might have trouble seeing it right off the bat, but it's very simple. And we'll spend some time looking at these in class too. You can see that there actually is a positive correlation happening here. Now the positive correlation shows is because the direction of the graph is moving from the bottom left to the top right. Let's show you as we circle it there to, so you can see it, but let's show you if there was no relationship at all, your scatter plot would be spread out all over the place. It would look like this. Okay, and this is, would be a correlation coefficient to represent this would be zero. There is no correlation whatsoever. Now, if it was a perfect positive correlation, which means every time A goes up, B goes up, okay, this would be a positive correlation of plus one, okay, or one. And you can see it forms a straight line going from the bottom left to the right. What if it was a perfect negative correlation? This means every time A happens, the less B happens. Okay, this is a negative correlation and a perfect negative correlation would be negative one. Okay, so when we look at the correlation coefficients, they not only tell us which direction the correlation is, whether it's positive or negative, but they also tell us how strong. So when we look at it, if we, you were to be asked, you know, which has a, a, higher, a stronger correlation, a correlation of positive 0.5 or a negative correlation of negative decimal 65 and hopefully you would answer negative decimal 65 despite it being negative it is more strongly correlated what are correlations good for all they do is kind of show us a relationship and there's all kinds of really interesting correlations we put together that smoking and lung cancer go together from correlations However, we couldn't say that smoking causes lung cancer until there was further research done. Because what correlation does is help predict. It does not imply the cause and effect. There's all kinds of interesting correlations that you can find. For example, the more ice cream eaten, the more violent crimes committed. That is a true correlation. Okay, does that mean though that somebody who is going to go out and murder somebody after they've done it, they desire a tasty frozen treat? 
Or is it eating ice cream makes people angry so they go kill? No, there's probably a third factor involved. So let's look at this example. Low self-esteem and depression are correlated. Okay, however, there's three scenarios we can look at. One, low self-esteem could cause depression. Another way thing that could happen is it could be the other way around. Depression could cause low self-esteem. Or there could be some other event, some external event that causes both of these. So we cannot say just because we've discovered this correlation that we can find a cause. So remember correlations, the researcher, you're not going to manipulate any data. You're just going to look at the data and see if it that's already there and see if there's a relationship between the two. By the way, the ice cream and murders is mostly because more ice cream is consumed in the in the summertime in hot weather and more murders are committed at that time. So it's an external event that caused that. We'll look at some more interesting uh, correlations in class. But other things that people get, remember we like to look for for uh, order and randomness as we looked at in, in, our, in part one of this. Uh, there's also illusory correlations that people fall prey to where these are we think there's a correlation but there's actually not a correlation like perhaps stepping on a crack and breaking your mother's back i don't know do you guys use that rhyme that was really big when i was little but i know you guys are i'm old anyways um there was no correlation or you know um in our example here in this picture we look at you know we always hear, hear those stories of a couple that's trying to have a child and they try and try and they can't have a child and so they finally adopt and what happens after they adopt well all of a sudden they're pregnant on their own and they have their own child okay um this story really stands out and we hear it you know a couple times and it seems like oh this happens all the time so we think well, there must be a strong correlation between adopting when you can't have children and then be and then conceiving a child but you have to look at all of the evidence and you can see we've got kind of four boxes in here. We have got confirming evidence and disconfirming evidence. So we look at the, you know, in, in the upper left quadrant here, we have somebody who adopts and then they conceive. Well, that confirms it. But what about all those people that adopt and don't conceive that would fit into the upper right? Or what about those that do not adopt, but they conceive? that's disconfirming. What about those that do not adopt and do not conceive? We have to look at all of those things. And if we did this, we would see, you know what? It's more of a random coincidence that this happened. This happened to my sister, by the way. Okay, so the correlation shows a relationship between things, but they're, the biggest thing I can tell you, and this is so stressed all the time, and I'll stress this to you, correlation does not show causation. Okay, correlation does not show causation. It only shows a relationship between the two things. The only thing, and this is what makes this, this method, research method different, that shows a causation is an experiment. Experiment's whole goal is to show cause and effect. And the reason we can do this is because we have strict control over the factors in our experiment. And so the whole basic idea is that if, if we have two groups of people, let's say, and we keep everything the same between these groups of people except one thing, then the difference is caused. If there is any difference caused in that one group, we can attribute it to that one thing. So the whole idea is to control all the factors. So let's take an experiment, uh, for example. So we get two groups. Let's say we're testing some kind of a pill, some kind of a treatment. We would take our... Uh, our group of people from the population which is our sample and we would randomly assign them into groups uh, the experimental group and the control group so the experimental group receives the treatment in, in the example I gave you would be the pill that we're talking about and the pill is an independent variable um, it's independent because that is the one that the the, the researcher will manipulate and the control group does not receive the treatment. They may receive, they may have a third group that receives a placebo, but a little bit more on that later. Okay, so remember, experimental group gets the treatment or the independent variable, control group does not. So why is it so important to randomly assign your groups? 
And when you randomly assign, again, you could draw names out of a hat, use the random number generator. There's several ways that we can go about this. But what we're trying to get rid of is there's really only two variables we're interested in our experiment. That does that independent variable cause something, which is the dependent variable. The dependent variable is the measure we're going to have. So let's say our pill is supposed to make you more intelligent. So the pill is the independent variable. The dependent variable is intelligence. And of course, we would need an operational definition for that, uh, which we mentioned in the last video, we could come up with, it's the score on a certain kind of IQ test. Okay, so when we randomly assign, there's all these factors that are different that we have difficulty controlling for. Um, you know, how, how many people, uh, for example, are in a bad mood, got in a fight at home, how many people had a good night's sleep, how many people didn't. Um, you know, you can't watch these people all the time and monitor all these things. So if you do assign these groups randomly, statistically, you should have an equal number of these people in each group, which helps to eliminate some of those factors that could get in the way of your results. Um, it's different from random sample random sample we were talking about in uh, in surveys where we take a sampling so the random assignment is we have a sample of the people from the population and then we put them into groups so random assignment is putting them into groups um, in experimentation too and another thing that can be a factor could be researcher bias we like to look for things to confirm what we want Let's say we had that pill that makes people intelligent or we think we do. We're going to look for anything and we're going to try anything we can to make sure that it works. We're not going to do it on purpose. It's just a natural bias that we have. So what we can use, researchers will use, is a single blind procedure or, or it's a double blind in this case when the research to get rid of the researcher bias. What a double blind procedure is, is the researchers and the subjects of the experiment don't know which condition they in they are in they don't know if they're in the control group they don't know if they're in the experimental group likewise the researchers don't know this so they're collecting data without that information um, the other thing we have happening is a placebo effect so if we're testing a medication for example a, um, a you know pharmaceutical therapy of some kind we are going to probably want to have a third group which is a placebo group a placebo is a very, um, it can be a quite a powerful effect. Uh, it's, it's not a um, permanent effect, uh, and it's not what we want to find. Uh, just the fact that you're given a pill, if you know that you're given this pill and somebody of authority tells you this and you think it's supposed to make you smarter, well, you probably will get a little bit smarter or you'll act like you're a little bit smarter um, just because we think it's going to be this way. And we'll talk more about this in class, but there's all kinds of placebos around the world that happen. A lot of those magnets and stuff, bracelets that you put on your arm, you know, they're supposed to stop you from being seasick and stuff. Uh, there's there's uh, all kinds of things. For example, in uh, in China, the use uh, a bear bladder is supposed to make you young and virile again, uh, to the point where people were in North America were killing bears, cutting out their bladder and shipping them overseas and selling them for like fifty thousand dollars therefore it is illegal to transport these bare bladders but it's purely placebo so a placebo is an inert substance that causes an effect inert means it doesn't do anything so let's again look at those independent and dependent variables remember that the group the treatment group gets the independent variable okay a confounding variable are those um, other variables out there that we have difficulty controlling for to keep the, the, the two groups the same. Um, and random assignment is there to try and counteract those these con confounding variables. Now the dependent variable is what is being measured. So if we were doing the uh, research on a pill that's supposed to make you more intelligent, the independent variable again is the pill. The dependent variable is intelligence. We've operationally defined it as a score on an IQ test. So maybe we would have our subjects take an IQ test as a baseline, and then they would have the pill, and then they would take the IQ test again and see if their score has changed. So what we're measuring is the intelligence, and that's the dependent variable. So does that variable depend on the independent variable? When you're looking at research and you're asked to identify independent and dependent variables, you should first identify the dependent variable because that is the thing that is being measured in the experiment. 
things that make research and, and, and experiments good is, are, is val validity and reliability. What validity is mean? Does this actually measure what it's supposed to measure? Is it valid in life? Here's a, an example of an experiment here. I'll, we'll come back to uh, validity. Uh, reliability, I, I got in the testing section there for a second. Anyhow, random assignment we show in, in these babies. we got groups. We have independent variable, dependent variable. So what we're looking at is, does breastfeeding make the child more intelligent? And they've defined their intelligence as the intelligence score at the age of six. And as we can see, the experimental group are the ones that have promoted breastfeeding and the control group did not promote breastfeeding. And you know what we found is that the group that was breastfed actually had higher intelligence scores. Then we thought there was all these other kinds of things and in further research we've kind of eliminated a lot of these other variables and it still looks like that might be the best for our brains as we're developing at the age of six. The nice thing is those kids kind of would catch up later. So this chart is really good. It, it, it covers a whole bunch of pages in your textbook. It shows you uh, the, the different research methods and kind of the things that are strong about them, weak about them, what's manipulated, how we conduct them, and the purposes of these, of these research techniques.